So we've covered quite a lot. I'm, I want to work now through a few other uh, key authors and some other contributions that others have made to this field, but Freud and Klein are really our grandparents in this area, um, and so they have laid the foundation for much of what follows after. So self-psychology uh, is a really interesting and useful th a therapeutic approach. Um, a chap called Kohut, whose picture you see at the top of the screen, uh, had clients in the 1960s who appeared self-assured, even grandiose and arrogant. He was working largely with men who were businessmen, very successful businessmen, uh, wealthy, um, accomplished uh, men of the world. And yet, despite all of this um, confidence and bravado, they reported an internal experience inside of themselves of feeling empty. So they felt like this, this great life that they appeared to be living was really like a mask and that on the inside they were feeling empty. And they reported a constant need for reassurance. So they kept needing the therapist to reassure them that they were okay, that they were good, that they were progressing, that they were uh, worthwhile, meaningful people. So this constant need, in a sense, to be uh, fed uh, with good milk. And so Kohut began to realize that his clients were mostly narcissistic. You know, it's very turned in on the self and focused on the self uh, with a grandiose sense of self. They reflected a weak, unstable sense of self, however. So although they were turned on the self, the self was actually very underdeveloped, a fragile, underdeveloped, weak, um, thin sense of self. They had difficulty regulating self-esteem, and so their ability to convince themselves that they were adequate people was very underdeveloped, and hence the constant need for reassurance. And he found them very hard to work with, so the actual therapeutic work with them was very difficult. So self-psychology helps us to understand that narcissism, the focus on the self and the, and the feelings of grandiosity and like I'm the king of the castle, is a normal part of early development and in fact an important part of early development uh, in early childhood. It provides for the, uh, providing for narcissistic needs then is central to the development of a secure self. So in early childhood, when a child wants to feel all powerful and in control and able to, I'm the king of the castle and you the dirty rascals, the sort of the nursery rhyme that I learned as a child, um, that sense of I'm powerful and omnipotent, I'm a superhero, I'm Wonder Woman, I'm Superman, is a very important part of developing a strong internal sense of self, that I am a person in my own right and that I can stand and I can argue and I can uh, impact the world. And so when infants and young children behave in these kinds of ways, good parenting requires us, in fact, to affirm and encourage that sort of behavior. When that is not provided, when a parent knocks a child down, when they behave in those kinds of ways, they develop a narcissistic personality disorder. And this manifests in therapy in two kinds of transferences. The mirror transference, which uh, is expressed through an, a need for validation, empathic acceptance and admiration. So there's a constant need to be able to look at somebody else when, almost as if one's looking in a mirror to have the other person say to you, I am, you are wonderful, you are incredible, you are powerful, you are smart, you are beautiful and so on. And if that mirror transference in early childhood is lacking from the early caregivers, what then develops in adulthood is a fragmented sense of self. So the self is underdeveloped, it's not strong and robust. The idealized transference is a different kind of transference that young children need in early childhood. And this is the need for an omnipotent, powerful, all-knowing parental figure. So in early childhood, children need to feel that their parents are very powerful and in control and capable and able and unflappable and um, um, un unhurtable. And, and so this need for an ideal parent in early childhood is an important part of their development. When parents are not able to look uh, to, to sort of step up into that sort of role, the child begins to develop an anxiety that the world is an unsafe place. So the idealized transference, so the this, this sense of a parent as being very powerful, provides soothing 
and then also affirms the child's own sense of omnipotence. So they're able to internalize this omnipotence. And if that is lacking, they can develop this grandiose self. So the self is this very, very big, powerful person, but actually it's paper thin. It's like a balloon that you just have to put the tiniest little prick and it'll pop. So it feels like this big balloon. It feels like it's really powerful and strong, but actually it's just full of air and it can be broken with just the slightest pinprick. Donald Winnicott, whose photo you see on the screen now, uh, is another really important uh, figure in psychodynamic theory and therapy. He was actually a pediatrician um, before he was a psychoanalyst. And a lot of his work, a lot of his writings were talks that he gave to mothers groups. So he went around as a pediatrician talking to um, mothers uh, with small children who'd gathered together to learn how to be better mothers. So the women's auxiliaries and all these different women's groups, the manana ladies and so on. Um, and so he, this is, these were the kinds of people he spoke to. And as a result, we have a lot of writing from Winnicott that was written for a lay audience rather than a technical audience. And that makes his work quite accessible and uh, useful. He speaks about the need for a facilitating environment uh, in much the similar kind of way that Roger speaker speaks uh, about this, the environment that allows someone to actualize the enabling environment. So this facilitating environment is the kind of space around a child. It's the person in environment, the social ecology around an infant that allows a child to grow and develop optimally. And uh, a lot of his writing is around how do we create that sort of environment? So how do we parent young children in ways that help them to grow and flourish and develop into well-adapted um, adults? One of the things he speaks about is the maternal reverie. Uh, reverie is a French word that sort of means to be a bit dreamy, so almost like in a dream state. And his argument is that when you have your baby, that you almost need to retreat from the world and enter into the space where it's just you, the mother and the child. And you spend um, at least a few weeks just in this dream, dreamy kind of state um, where you're immersed in the experience of your child. And those of you who've had children and were able to stay home and have someone take care of you might remember experiencing something like that. Almost just all you were thinking about, you're really preoccupied with your baby and raising your baby and holding them and feeding them and clothing them and bathing them and massaging them and uh, taking care of them and sleeping with them and having them close to you and the smell of them. And it's this experience that allows the development um, of the psychology of the child in this early experience of projection and introjection that we've been speaking about. Winnicott uses this lovely phrase, good enough mothering or good enough parenting and the good enough mother. He says, you don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect parents. We just have to be good enough. It's that balance of good to bad that I spoke about a little earlier. There just needs to be a little bit more good than bad. And then you'll be able to raise a relatively healthy young person. And so this eases some of the pressure on, uh, on parents and particularly mothers who feel that there's these huge expectations that they have to live up to. And he says, no, it's fine to make mistakes and it's fine not to be perfect and it's fine sometimes to be depressed or to not be available so long as the overall balance is towards the good. And we can say the same for therapy uh, because therapy in many ways is, is a form of mothering. And so it's okay as a therapist to make mistakes and to be imperfect so long as overall on the whole, uh, you're doing more good than bad. He says that there's no such thing as a baby. A baby does not exist. The only thing that really exists is a nursing couple. So a parent and a baby together with the parent feeding this child, that's all that exists. And this is very social work in many ways. I don't know if all of this, if you can hear what Winnicott is describing is really the person and environment. It's the ecological approach or the ecosystems approach that we advocate in social work. That an individual never stands alone. An individual is always in relationship to others. And in Africa, we also understand this as Ubuntu, that a person is not a person on their own. A person is only a person through their relationships with other people. It is in our relationships with the people around us that we become people. And in infancy, it's the relationship with the primary caregiver that is really of critical importance. Hence, his concept of the nursing couple. It is the parent figure 
who nurses, which is another word for feeds, who feeds the child and feeds the infant and takes care of the infant. It is this couple that exists. A baby on its own cannot exist. He speaks about maternal holding, which is a sense of kind of holding a child close to oneself in a protective way, um, and particularly the idea of, sort of skin to skin. Um, and so the child is then connected to the parent and held and embraced in this very safe environment. He also writes about transitional objects and says that as a baby uh, begins to grow through their first year or two of life, they will begin to take on objects such as a blanket or a teddy bear, particularly objects that smell a bit like the, the mother. Um, and so a, a blanket that the mother wrapped around herself when she was feeding will begin to smell like the mother. Um, and then the child is able to use that, that physical object, the blanket, as a transitional object. So when mother is away, the child is able to hold onto this blanket and the blanket in a sense represents the mother because it, it tr and it helps the child to transition towards being a bit more independent. And so these objects, these what are usually kind of soft things like a blanket or a teddy bear or a little rabbit or a toy are important objects um, in the life of a child and um, are things that we should allow children to keep even into uh, later childhood. So uh, we try not to wash those blankets because we would like them to smell a bit like mum and we also don't take away a teddy bear from a child when we think that they're too old for it and throw it away because actually that child in some ways represents the mother. And so the transitional objects then become things that one can use uh, or that a child uses to become increasingly independent. And I wanted at this point just to share with you an experience that I had uh, when I was a client in therapy with a Jungian therapist. I was at a stage where I was extremely vulnerable psychologically. I was an adult, I was a qualified practicing social worker, but I was going through a profound depression and having to face some very, very painful experiences um, from my earlier life. And I was seeing my therapist once a week and the gap between these two weeks was just too great and I wasn't able to really sustain my emotional well-being between these two weeks, uh, sorry, between the weeks of the, se of the two sessions. And so at the end of one session, when my therapist Chris could see that I was very fragile, um, he went to his shelf of toys. So he was a play therapist and he had one of these huge shelves with all of these little toys and, and objects. And he took down an object that was a little, um, little porcupine or a hedgehog actually I think it was that was really this small the kind of the size of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a small nut um, and was made from clay by hand and he brought it to me and he pressed it into my hand and said here take take this with you and I took that object that little that little toy and I kept it in my pocket <laughs> and Every day I had it in my pocket and when I began feeling fragile or like I was falling apart or like I couldn't hold myself together, I would put my hand into my pocket and I would take it out and I would hold it and I felt like Chris was there with me and I felt the sense of containment that came from knowing that he was caring for me and that he was supporting me and nourishing me. And so I was able to get through those weeks uh, for a while um, by using this transitional object which I still have many, many years later. The last uh, important concept, not the only important concept, but a last important concept that comes from Winnicott is the sense of true self and false self. So his um, argument, which is really a structural argument, and if you remember from narrative therapy, we say that we're living now in a post-structuralist society. Uh, but his argument is that there is a, a deep inner core of who we truly are the real authentic you. So Adrian as he really is when he is not defending himself or trying to pretend to be a professor or pretend to be a parent or pretend to be a good citizen of society but the deep inner core of who I am. And then we build up around that a series of false selves which in a sense are our masks that we use to engage with the world around us. Now he's not saying that these masks that we use to behave appropriately, so I'm behaving as a professor, uh, he's not saying that these are wrong, he's not saying that they're not authentic even though he calls them false, 
but he says that there are times when those false selves can become so alienated, so so um, dissimilar from the true self, and they can become so powerful that we actually begin to get confused that the false self might actually be the true self. Or we might spend so much time performing the false self role that we forget who our true self is. And he says, this is dangerous. Rather, what his argument is, is that the true self and the false self should be quite congruent. They should be quite closely connected to each other and not too dissimilar. So I typically ask people in all contexts of my life to call me Adrian. I ask you as students to call me Adrian. I ask people at my church to call me Adrian. My wife and my son and my mother all call me Adrian. And I ask people to call me Adrian because I am Adrian. I'm always Adrian. No matter what role I'm performing, no matter what role I'm in, when I'm teaching you now, I'm teaching you as Adrian. The person that you're encountering now is who I really am. You're not encountering some persona, some mask. You're encountering the real person who is Adrian, who is not very dissimilar from the Adrian that my wife and my son know. Um, and so he's suggesting that as, as we grow, that when the false self becomes too disconnected from the true self, that's when life becomes a bit problematic. I'd like to cover just a, a last few other concepts that are drawn from various different authors working in the psychodynamic uh, field. Um, concepts that I found helpful or terms that I think are important for you just to be aware of. Um, Hartman is the development of a, a, a practice approach called ego psychology, which really focuses on developing the strengths of the ego and the various roles that the ego plays, um, such as reality testing, decision making, planning, frustration, tolerance and impulse control. Uh, and so this is a particularly useful approach that is in some ways rooted in the psychodynamic tradition. But rather than focusing on uncovering the unconscious, which is what Freud and others have mostly focused on, works really on strengthening and bolstering the ego and its functions. For people who are psychologically vulnerable, uh, strengthening the ego is very often the place that we have to start. So we start by strengthening the ego so that when we begin to move into the unconscious and into their uh, person's experiences of trauma and so on, uh, they have greater ego strengths that enable them to confront and face those difficult experiences. The notion of skin emerges in a number of psychodynamic authors' work, including Esther Bick uh, and Francis Tustin, who writes about the second skin. And in a sense, skin is, is a kind of a metaphor. So the skin on our body is a, is a metaphor for the containment of the ego or of the self. And the idea is that as we develop our uh, physical sense of where our body stops and, uh, then, and the world begins, the external world begins, as we develop that, we're also developing a greater sense of self. And so the idea of self, in a sense, is very much contained within our skin. And but the purpose of, of human skin, more, more animal skin, is really to create a boundary between the person and the environment. Um, and so skin is an important part of defining who I am in contrast to everything else in the world. Um, and it is for this reason that uh, many of us believe that as uh, when, uh, when we have small infants, that skin to skin contact is a really important part of their development. And as we stroke a child or massage a child and touch their skin, and as their skin touches up against our own skin, um, this begins to develop a greater sense of the self, of the ego, of this is who I am, uh, through this sort of metaphorical skin. Carl Jung uh, developed the field of analytical psychology. Um, his work has influenced my work a lot. Um, and he talks about many wonderful, interesting, and sometimes difficult to grasp concepts. But one of the important concepts that Jung writes about is the shadow. And by shadow, he is referring to all the aspects of our self that we don't want to face up to, uh, that we don't want to acknowledge, all the sort of dark material that we wish wasn't there. So, uh, for example, if I see myself as a very spiritual person, uh, then everything that is unspiritual or anti-spiritual uh, would be in, my sh in, in the shadow. 
if I see myself as a kind, uh, loving kind of person, then uh, in my shadow would be, find, would be found a person who is um, hateful or violent or hostile. Um, and part of the development of a person, according to Jung, to become individualized and to develop into a full, well-functioning whole person is to recognize and acknowledge and even embrace our shadow and to recognize that what is in our shadow is as much who we are and part of who we are as what is in the light. I've always found this to be a really useful concept because in a sense what Jung is saying is that things that we put into the dark um, can fester and, and go rotten and dark and grow. So we think of, for example, a potato. When you put a potato into a dark cupboard, think what happens to it. It, it first grows little shoots, um, but gradually over time it begins to rot. And if you ever smelt a really rotten potato, you know that it's really pretty gross. Um, and so potatoes almost do better when they're just in the light. And the light keeps them clean, light keeps them healthy. Um, and so bringing stuff that's in our shadow, the, so our shadow material is how Jung would refer to it, bringing shadow material into the light, acknowledging it, validating it, um, seeing it for what it is, in fact, is part of becoming a much more healthy and well-rounded human being. Freud writes about defense mechanisms. These defense mechanisms are very central in Freudian psychology and an important part of understanding how people uh, function and also how people dysfunction. And so a large part of Freud's work is focused on understanding defense mechanisms, helping to reduce them, not to get rid of them because defenses are important. We always have to protect ourselves in much the same way as physiologically we need a, an immune system whose job it is to defend us against attacks from viruses and bacteria and other kinds of pathogens. In the same sort of way psychologically we need defenses to protect us um, from psychological assault in the world. But when those defense mechanisms become overreactive uh, we def almost develop an autoimmune disease psychologically where the defense mechanisms actually begin to harm our development. And so learning to use defense mechanisms in more flexible ways and to reduce their hold that they might have over us uh, is an important part of uh, Freudian therapy. John Bowlby is in very important uh, work around attachment separation and loss. He is the originator of attachment theory, which has become increasingly important and central in a social work around the world. Um, so more and more social workers are using attachment theory as a, an important framework for understanding children um, and especially vulnerable children who we might think about removing from parental care and placing in alternative care. Um, and also as we understand the shifts and the changes that children experience in caregivers over time. And so Bowlby's work, which is now you know, quite old and yet remains an important foundation for contemporary attachment theory, um, is an important uh, aspect of psychodynamic practice and theory for us to be aware of. And the last concept I wanted to mention is the notion of containment, uh, which comes from Wilfred Bion, who was a British psychoanalyst. Um, it's similar to what Winnicott called the holding environment. Um, and the idea of containment is that we are all in need of, of something that kind of holds almost like a basket or a calabash that holds our self and holds our vulnerability and all of the challenges that we experience in life. And that it is in the context of a container um, that we are able to face and deal with difficulties in life. It in, in some ways is quite similar to the concept of skin because skin in a similar sort of way contains our, in, our inners, our inward uh, or inside piece bits. And so for Bion, an important therapeutic role for psychotherapists is to contain their clients and to create in the therapeutic relationship a holding space um, that is able to contain our clients. And I wanna go back briefly to the concept of the transitional object. When my therapist, Chris, gave me that uh, little hedgehog, what he was doing was that he was strengthening the therapeutic container so that it would continue containing me between the weekly sessions that we were having. And in so doing, he created an extension of the therapeutic container through this transitional object. 
I hope what you can see from this slide and the slides that we've gone before, which in many ways are really just skimming over the surface of psychodynamic theory, is that this is a very rich and diverse collection of theories developed by different authors and um, practitioners working in different contexts with different kinds of clients and applying their own lived experience of how to make sense of the world around them and in particular to make sense of people's um, psychological and psychosocial distress. So I thought it might be useful to come back to Lemma, Lemma's book, which is the book uh, with which I started to say, if you're going to buy a book, uh, her book is probably a really useful first text to have on your shelf. She identifies nine psychoanalytic assumptions, and I'm going to run through those quite quickly. We've actually talked about all of them, um, and I'm just going to pull uh, this lecture together by uh, running through these again. So first of all, she says that psychoanalysis assumes that we have a conscious as well as an unconscious mental life. A lot of the counseling that we learn as social workers at undergraduate level is focused only on the, un only on the conscious life. Psychoanalysis uh, reminds us that there is a whole unconscious level of life that in fact is the largest part of our mental life that is important and that we uh, should give attention to. Secondly, she says that meaning systems include both conscious or verbalizable and unconscious or wordless aspects of experience. So as we make sense of our life, and as these meaning systems influence the way that we behave in relationship to other people and the world, it includes not only what we're able to verbalize that's conscious, what uh, Rogers would call symbolized experience, but also unconscious, often wordless, often things that we don't know about, or in Rogers' terms, unsymbolized experience. And so both are important in shaping the way we make sense of the world and the way in which we engage with the world around us. And so psychoanalytic um, um, understandings of human behavior are then quite important. Thirdly, psychoanalysis assumes that causality is located in both the external and internal wor worlds. I think sometimes we think psychoanalysis is really only interested in the internal person, but in fact, and we'll see this particularly when we come to the practice of it, it is really interested in interpersonal relationships and what happens between people and between people and the world. And so what causes our behavior is both stuff that's in the world around us in the environment, as well as inside of us in our intrapsychic functioning. And this is what we refer to in social work as person in environment. It is drawing on both worlds. Fourthly, psychoanalysis assumes that early relationships, early in life, help to develop internal representations of relationships that are affectively toned. Remember the word affect refers to emotion, emotions. So these early relationships that we have with our primary caregivers, very often our mother and our father, but quite very often also grandparents uh, or an aunt or um, a child and youth care worker or a foster parent. These early relationships that we have in our first years of life develop internal representations or templates of relationships that have emotional feelings attached to them. So feelings of love, but also feelings of hate, feelings of acceptance and rejection and neglect and so on. Fifthly, psychoanalysis assumes that we have an internal life that gives texture and color to each new situation that we encounter. So these internal representations and this internal life, almost, we almost have like a cast of characters inside our mind, shapes the way that we encounter new situations. And so we bring these previous experiences into new situations and new relationships, and they shape and color, they give texture and color to each new situation that we encounter. Sixthly, Lemma says that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis assumes that our relationship with the external world is mediated by our internal world. And so as we relate to the world around us, to people and to social structures and institutions around us, we are not relating to them only on their own terms, but also in relation to this internal world that we've been talking about. So these external relationships have their own life, but they're also shaped and mediated by our internal life. Seventh, the internal and external worlds are in perpetual, reciprocal and dynamic interaction. And this is 
I mean, I think this is the best psychodynamic um, description of what we in social work mean by person in environment. In person and environment, we say that people cannot be understood except in relation to their environment. And environments don't make any sense except in relationship to the people who populate them. These two, person and environment, are reciprocal. They're closely intertwined. And social work most or best positions itself at the interface between people and the environment, at that point where they connect. And here Lemme is saying the internal and external worlds, the person and environment, are in perpetual reciprocal and dynamic interaction with each other. This really is the kind of one of the heart of social work, interestingly. The eighth assumption of psychoanalysis is that we all have a developmental history and a current life, both of which are important in therapy. So social work counseling most typically focuses only on the current life. We focus on present problems in living. We focus on the current situation that clients are experiencing. What psychoanalysis reminds us is that as important as that is, there is also a developmental history that comes from earlier times in one's life. It could be last year or it could be 30 or 50 years ago when you were an infant. These are important uh, for us to think about in therapy. And finally, her ninth assumption of psychoanalysis that is that in therapy, we are always dealing with the developmental or historical and the conflict or present pathology. So the developmental or historical is the stuff that comes from our early childhood. What they call conflict or present pathology is what we are facing right now, our present situation, present experience. In psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, we are always dealing with both. And what varies is their respective contribution. So for some clients, we might focus a bit more on the historical, whereas for other clients, we might focus a bit more on the present. And for yet other clients, we might focus very much on the interaction between them. I think these nine assumptions that Lemma presents as, as core psychoanalytic assumptions capture a lot of the uh, detail that we've been going through in these last slides and in the past hour and a half. <clears throat> So I'm finishing in a way with uh, a reference to a book um, by Donald Spence called The Freudian Metaphor, which was given to me by my supervisor when I was a fourth year undergraduate student. I must confess that I've never actually read the whole of this book, but I've always appreciated the title. Um, I th think sometimes we feel that the problem with psychoanalysis is that it is trying to tell us something objectively true about the mind, that there really is an id, that there really is an ego and a superego, that there really are internal objects and part objects and fantasy and so on. What this book's title suggests for us is that what Freud brings that is useful for us in therapy is a collection of metaphors or symbols or analogies that help us as therapists to make sense of our client's experience. And in this sense, Freudian or psychoanalytic therapy is quite similar to narrative therapy, because what we're saying is it's not the objective truth of whether the id exists or whether the Oedipus complex actually exists. Rather, these Freudian psychoanalytic um, terms and concepts provide us with language with which we can begin to reauthor clients' lives. And so we begin to tell stories using these metaphors that we draw from this very rich tradition of psychoanalysis to construct stories that help people make sense of themselves in ways that empower them to make sense of and deal with the difficulties that they face in life in a way that enables them to move forward in life towards greater satisfaction and greater positive engagement with their environment. And so I'm not so worried about the truth or the falsehood of uh, Freud and his followers' concepts. I'm not so worried whether there is brain research that shows these things to be true or not true. What I have found helpful in my practice is that these things that we have discussed in this, in this lecture provide us with a collection of metaphors that clients often find quite useful in understanding the challenges and the disturbances that take place in their mind, as well as in their relationships with people, both in the present and in the past. And that is what therapy in many ways is about. 
So I hope that you found this uh, lecture useful. It's been quite long, just over 90 minutes, and we have covered a lot of ground. We have really only tickled the very skin of psychodynamic theory. There is so much depth and so much detail that we couldn't possibly go into in one lecture. I encourage you to get hold of Lemma or another book on, the, on an introduction to psychodynamic theory and to uh, brush up on the concepts that we've covered here and to explore some more of the concepts that are available in this practice model.